It's the 31st of March 2020 and welcome to the Institute of Economic Affairs podcast with me, Darren Grimes. Uh, Don't forget to subscribe by the way because we're putting out a lot of content during isolation to cure your boredom through economic analysis, so I'm sure you won't want to miss it. Now, the media got very excited yesterday about a line in Boris Johnson's recent video update where he says that the country's response to COVID-19 shows that there really is such a thing as society. Now, immediately, journalists jumped upon the remark as if to say this signals a step change from Thatcherite, no such thing as society, mantra. But for The Telegraph Online, the IEA's head of regulatory affairs, Victoria Hewson, has argued that in reality, Miss Thatcher's comments about individuals taking responsibility for their own actions have been taken completely out of context. So what do today's guests interpret the comments as actually meaning? Is there such a thing as society? And what does Boris Johnson's apparent rejection of the year of Margaret Thatcher's pro-market policies for the economy mean for the UK economy and, crucially, its recovery post-coronavirus? I've got the IEA's Dr Christian Nemitz joining me and the IEA's Head of Regulatory Affairs who wrote the piece, Victoria Hewson. Hello to both of you. Hello. How are you both doing? Could be worse. Yeah. Isolation's not driving you completely mad then? Well, it's still miserable outside. Let's see how it goes if it gets spring-like. Yeah. Now, Victoria, Boris Johnson was referring to Margaret Thatcher's famous reflection in a 1987 interview with Woman's Own. And in it, she says there is no such thing as society. Now, you've argued that far from proving Mrs. Thatcher wrong, the Prime Minister's examples of hard work and self-sacrifice in the common good show that actually she was right. Do you reckon Mr. Johnson has fundamentally misunderstood Mrs. Thatcher's views on society? And what do you actually interpret them as being? Well, so in the piece, I actually quoted the rest of those famous words that Mrs. Thatcher used in the 1987 interview with Women's Own magazine. And she did say there's no such thing as society, but she went on to say that what we have is people and families working together to look after themselves and to turn around and also look after their neighbours. And she called this a a living tapestry. And she went on to say, governments can only act through people. And obviously the the nuance of, of that account has been lost because in particular the left have seized upon the first words Uh, of the passage, there's no such thing as society, as Mrs. Thatcher disdaining the very fact of people having any fellow feeling or community uh, values. Whereas in fact, she was saying almost the opposite of that, which is that governments can only act through people and people act best when they are using their own Uh, sense of personal responsibility because actually the state isn't usually very good at looking after people as we can see through the horrors of um, you know people getting stuck in the welfare system for example. Now as to what Boris Johnson meant some people in response to my piece sort of suggested that I was over overthinking it and he didn't really mean that Um, he wasn't particularly referring to Mrs Thatcher's remarks I would say it's a strange formulation to use if you're not specifically referring to to that quotation from Mrs. Thatcher. And um, I think it's quite a common thing for Conservative Party leaders in the recent past to try and distance themselves from Thatcherism because it's seen as being cold and and friendly and um, anti-community. And obviously Boris Johnson was very much trying to show this um, sense of togetherness. So I think it's a shame, however, that he felt the need to do that by essentially distancing himself and by implication criticising Mrs Thatcher's words and her philosophy. 
Christian, it's interesting, isn't it, to see a Conservative Prime Minister attack their most successful post-war leader, at least as far as winning elections is concerned, if we, if we uh, reduce it to, to that being the success metric for a politician. Do you think this is part of the Conservative move to the left as far as the economy is concerned? I think it is, yes. And as Victoria said, this is a continuation of a longer trend. Uh, David Cameron said something similar when he said, there is such a thing as society, it's just different from the state, as if that was somehow in contrast to uh, what Margaret Thatcher meant. That That is clearly uh, the, the spirit of her quote, that, that that is exactly the same sentiment. Uh, but he nonetheless felt the need to distance himself uh, from her in that way. Maybe in his case, it was really just rhetoric. Maybe in his case, it was really just his way of selling this uh, concept of the big society. But uh, we then saw the same uh, trend under Theresa May, and in her case, it wasn't just rhetoric. This this was really she then went on to uh, position herself more or less in equidistance to the libertarian right, as she called it, and the socialist left, uh, and, and and saying she and her party we are the centre ground. We are uh, about equally far away from both of these extremes, and I, I see this very much in this spirit. But it is a bit strange. I mean, it, it's it's not uh, unusual that the left would perhaps intentionally misunderstand that quote. I mean, I have I have trouble believing that somebody honestly and genuinely misunderstand because it, it is such a, an obvious and almost banal statement. I, I think, in fact, that would be a better criticism of it, that uh, since this is just about reciprocity, she is saying something that's actually on, on the face of it fairly, fairly banal, uh, doesn't, doesn't mean very much. It's always been a case that people on the left tried to misrepresent that quote uh, but the fact that we now see figures on the, the center right and the right doing the same thing shows that they've essentially given up trying to salvage that legacy legacy and they now seem to see thatcherism as a sort of a sin of youth something that if you're on on the right you have to be ashamed of and distance yourself from yeah i mean christian you mentioned theresa may there one of the um key powers behind the throne during the May years was Nick Timothy. Now, he's been writing quite a lot on on issues around this and the, the need for the, the need, I put that in quotes, for the Conservative Party to move further to the left in order to keep a hold of the seats that it won in 2019. <coughs> do, you, do you think he's got a point as far as Mrs Thatcher fostered a culture of individualism and... Th- the current crisis, for example, recommends that we need a more active state in normal times to protect citizens from these types of crises. Do you not think that many voters will be listening to people like Nick Timothy opine on things like this and possibly agree with him? Well, I don't buy the idea that she did make society more individualistic. I don't think a a prime minister uh, has that power. Of course, she changed economic policy and, uh, and, and quite radically in, in some respects, but I don't think uh, the, the head of a government can really uh, affect people's values very much. Even in, in long-lasting dictatorships, we, we, can, we can see that dictators don't manage to impose their values on the whole population, that as, as soon as uh, they're in, in areas that they can't reach, people still do their own thing, and you, you can't easily control the society's values in such a way. And uh, this this applies even more in the case of a, of a democratic prime minister. It's it's uh, mo- most people most of the time don't pay that much attention to politics anyway. I, I I don't think just because you hear the prime minister talking about something that you can interpret as as being pro uh, competition, pro entrepreneurship. I I don't think that in a meaningful sense changes people's values. You can maybe make that case if you believe that having lots of nationalized industries somehow makes society more cohesive, that people identify very strongly with these nationalized industries and feel that British Telecom is really their company, that uh, British Airways, when it was stayed on, was was really their airline company. But I I just have trouble believing that anybody thought of it in in that way. Um, I I guess to most people, these companies would have felt remote and run by Whitehall bureaucrats. And uh, 
I just have trouble believing that this fostered a sense of national community, just having these massive state-run conglom conglomerates. Uh, what, what Thatcherism meant is she did not believe that it is the role of the state to run half of the economy. And that is that doesn't strike me as a particularly radical sentiment, but uh, she had little to offer in, in, in the sense of telling people how they should go about their their own uh, personal lives and how they should relate to their neighbors and, and communities. That, and, and, and rightly so, that, that isn't the job of a prime minister. And um, I just don't buy the idea that she fundamentally changed the values of, of the country. That, that's more a criticism that the left has always come up with because they struggle with the fact that Margaret Thatcher was quite popular with working class voters. Mm. And of course, if you take a Marxist perspective, that shouldn't happen. She should be, uh, then you would see her as a representative of the, the capitalist class. She is the class enemy. And you see yourself as the voice of the working class. And that is then hard to square with the fact that uh, working class people quite like her. Uh, of course, you can, you can use the old Marxist trope of false consciousness, but even that wouldn't explain why she would be more popular than a more general generic conservative candidate and um, this is how why they had to create this narrative that she somehow manipulated people and instilled false values in their minds but um, short of of a, a totalitarian society and or even there uh, only within limits I, I i just can't see how a democratic prime minister uh, can really do that even someone who is in power for a long time victoria do you agree with that Yes, I do. And I think, um, you know, in many ways that there was there was something about the December 2019 general election that was quite similar to the way Mrs. Thatcher came to power in that she was able to speak to aspirational um, working class voters in, in a way that I guess Boris Johnson was also able to do. Um, looking ahead, um, I think it would be a shame if he was to waste that opportunity and end up essentially talking down to northern working class voters in sort of you know t t tapping them on patting them on the head and saying it's all right um nanny's here and now. i think i'll just um mention another interesting piece in this context was christian's piece on the iea blog recently about communitarianism which is which i think very much focuses on how certain people like Nick Timothy somehow miss the point in that they are noticing, well, this is my account of it, Christian will obviously describe it much better than me, but I think people people like the Blue Labour um, commentators do, I think, correctly pick up that people do still very much have a desire for a strong family and a sense of place and, and, and all of these um, motherhood and apple pie qualities and where i think i agree with christian in his piece is that these people then often miss the point and say that it's um thatcherism and a culture of individualism that is threatening these things whereas actually in many ways it's progressive left-wing government interventions that are threatening these things it's um you know distortive distortive funding and subsidies and the emphasis on higher education perhaps that causing people to struggle to get on in the labour market. It's government interventions in the housing market that mean it's very difficult for families to, to buy their own home. So I think while it's certainly fair for um, people to say that you know families are struggling to get on and productivity is low and people are perhaps not feeling as wealthy as they might like, I think it's very wrong to attribute that to free market policies and, and a so-called culture of individualism. In fact, in many ways, it's the reverse. It's government interventions that are causing these um, these things to happen. I mean, Christian, Victoria touched on it earlier, but Mrs. Thatcher spoke of a tapestry of men and women and people and the beauty of that tapestry and the quality of our lives that depend upon how much each of us is prepared to take responsibility for ourselves and each of us prepared to turn around and help by our own efforts, those who are unfortunate. Now, that doesn't sound to me like someone that doesn't believe in society or believe that society is a thing or, you know, some Ayn Rand fanatic, for example. Um, this sounds to me like someone who has fund what are fundamentally 
views found all over Christendom, you know, the, the fundamentally mm. Christian beliefs in society. It, it just, it beggars belief for me that this, the idea that this woman did not believe in society, and perhaps she didn't believe in it in a sort of, uh, I guess, a quite a communist <laughs> way of thinking, you know, where everyone is, each individual is exactly the same and you get the same sorry lot in life. She certainly didn't believe that. But do you do you agree with me that it's quite fanciful, actually, to argue, to try and even argue that case? It is, and I, I'm glad you mentioned Ayn Rand because I was just going to say uh, Ayn Rand is probably the only liberal thinker whose views you could maybe characterize in this way. But Ayn Rand is a very controversial figure even among liberals. And I would say Randianism is a sort of teenage liberalism. I can see that why that would appeal to you if you read uh, After Struct at school and most of your teachers are lefties and, and you feel that this is a sort of uh, a rebellion against them. But uh, most people grow out of that pretty quickly. I and mean, this uh, sort of hyper -individu individualistic liberalism is, is really um, a, a very, very much a fringe phenomenon of liberalism most most liberals have a a much richer understanding of of uh, society it's just that and th this is the part that uh, nick timothy and people of of his ilk get wrong they believe that liberals just don't understand the value of community life of social cohesion whereas of course, obviously, uh, other things equal. Of course, I'd rather live in a high trust society than in a low trust society. Other things equal. Of course, I'd rather live in a society where uh, people care about their neighbors and uh, and and, and uh, wider society around them than in a dog eat dog, everyone for himself society. The liberal argument is simply that these are things that the state cannot consciously plan. You cannot make a society more cohesive. And to, to the extent that we can measure social cohesion, I mean, there are some attempts to do this. There's the, the social trust index where you uh, ask people questions uh, such as um, most people can be trusted. Uh, do you agree with this? Or you can't be too careful in dealing with other people. Do you agree with that? And with, with uh, surveys of that kind, you try to, to construct uh, an index of how trusting different societies are. And what we see is that uh, the the level of social trust is something that is fairly stable over time and and just hard to shift. I couldn't think of a policy that would strengthen it. Uh, we can see that uh, on on those measures, the Scandinavian countries are the most high trusting societies. Japan is fairly high up. Switzerland is a very very much a high trust society. Um, with Mediterranean societies much further down the list, Britain somewhere in between. I don't know what you would do if you wanted to make a society more more trusting. These are uh, things that are just not amenable to policies. In If anything, I see a danger that if you try to deliberately uh, prioritize communities, make people more community spirited, what you would do is uh, a lot of groups would then try to get their own pet projects through because you can always say this is good for the community. This is somehow um, strengthening the fabric of society. And we see this already in those areas, in those policy areas that are already, that you could describe as maybe communitarian. Uh, the land use planning system is probably the most communitarian aspect of, uh, of the British state, because this is quite explicitly taken out of the framework of market transactions. This isn't about uh, supply and demand. This is about uh, communities getting together quite deliberately, uh, arguing about, debating what their housing needs are, what kind of development they want to see. And what we see here is mostly uh, these are uh, these sort of planning meetings get monopolized by NIMBYs, by wealthy homeowners who are already quite well housed uh, and who use these forums to simply shut down development. Now, this is uh, this strikes me as a very selfish activity, uh, but this takes place completely outside of the framework of markets. So I don't 
by the idea that uh, egoism, selfishness exists only in markets, and that if you expand the collective sphere, the, the, the sphere of politics, of collective decision making, that that somehow creates a more cohesive society. If, if anything, in those areas, we see the opposite, uh, that we see groups using forums like this, forums for collective decision making, to further their own ends in this way through politics using their political muscle and uh, we, we can also see this in uh, in, in other areas um, I mean one example would be and this is an organization that uh, that I'm personally a member of uh, which is the campaign for real ale they sometimes try to uh, prevent the conversion of pubs into flats or supermarkets uh, because this is uh, obviously a, a society of of, uh, of beer snobs of, of of pub snobs and uh, they are uh, arguing oh yes market signals may say uh, that there's a greater demand for for flats here or greater demand for supermarkets however pubs are good for the community clearly they are using the, the planning system in, the, in this way to further their own pet projects and uh, uh, i say this as a member it's non it's nonetheless true the, these are their pet projects and they're using the communitarian rhetoric to disguise their own interests maybe not interests in the sense of material interest but doesn't always have to be and um and and, and that's generally the problem with uh, communitarianism that since there is no obvious measure of how you would strengthen community bonds, it's it's just very easy to convince yourself that what the things that you like anyway are also good for social cohesion. Uh, Victoria, do you think the new communitarianism that Christian speaks about so eloquently, which is found, by the way, on the left and the right, um, of course, Nick Timothy being a, someone associated with the right, perhaps not economically, um, but since the financial crash, a love of the market economy has been under threat and attack since then, hasn't it really? Do you think that these these new calls for this new communitarianism it, is directly linked to the financial crash? I think there's something to that. Um, and obviously... And basically in, in, what I'm saying is, are in, we screwed? Are the free marketeers screwed? Well, so in many in many ways, the financial crash crash was something that perhaps potentially similar to the um, COVID nineteen outbreak. It becomes something that everyone was able to project their favoured political views and um, policy prescriptions onto. So, for people on the left, the financial crash was evidence of um, financial speculators running wild in a deregulated financial sector. Whereas I guess for um, we free marketers, we would say, well, actually it was more because um, there was too much regulation and the market wasn't allowed to properly work as it would have if the incentives had been better and the liabilities had been better allocated um, in, a, in a real market sense. So th there's certainly no doubt that the after effects of this coronavirus shutdown will be um, long lasting. But, you know, we are still in many ways feeling the after effects of the financial crash in 08. And unless the optimistic sort of idea that we'll have a very quick bounce back and a V-shaped recovery from this temporary shutdown, then there is a danger that similar with the, the post-08 um, landscape, we will be bogged down in a very slow, drawn out um, recovery. And unfortunately, if the um, sort of direction of travel remains as it is at the moment with the expectation that it's the state that will step in and through borrowing and bailouts, that's you know that's going to be the way to get the economy back on track then that's actually going to cause more um more harm than good the uh the remedy is going to be worse than the disease and actually what we should see is that as soon as the restrictions are lifted businesses should be supported and incentivized to unleash um in in the phrase of last year unleash britain's potential by actually removing lots of the burdens that would otherwise have prevented them from progressing rather than by trying to artificially intervene in some way um, and, and prop up 
businesses that are not managing to to get through yeah i mean christian to to bring remarks in this recording to a close i mean do you think how does this all look to you moving forward if i ask you to play the role of mystic meg for a second and uh you think about the uk after coronavirus judging by the amount of attacks on you know thatcherism that we've seen even over the past 24 hours you know with people saying it's happy days the prime minister has rejected thatcher blah 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 do you think this bodes well for the economic response to coronavirus do you assume a much bigger and much more active state is here to stay I think so. Although the the measures uh, that have now been announced are clearly crisis measures, I think yeah. they will be reversed. There is no way uh, that they can be sustained forever. But if this leads to a general shift uh, of public opinion towards, well, either socialism among left-wingers or communitarianism among right-wingers, then this could lead to all sorts of interventions uh, into the economy in the, in the future. Because we've, we've seen this also in the case of the financial crisis, that suddenly all sorts of interventions that have actually nothing to do with this particular crisis were justified by a general anti-market sentiment, uh, where the, the logic seemed to be markets have failed this is somehow anti-market therefore this must be good and we we could see something like that uh, again i mean the the problem here is that um in times of crisis people often double down on their pre-existing worldview and you, you can see this all over social media that everyone sees this as a confirmation of what they've already believed and what they've always believed uh, i've seen people with um with wildly different worldviews not uh, all separately, independently of each other, claiming that this uh, vindicates their worldview. Now, this is, of course, logically impossible. It can't uh, simultaneously vindicate absolutely everybody. But you see socialists arguing, oh, look, this shows that we need socialism. You see communitarians arguing, look, this is why we need to stop globalization. And this is why we need uh, a communitarian economy, whatever that would mean in detail. You see people saying uh, this shows that we need to uh, to stop the, the Brexit negotiations. Uh, you see people saying the, the opposite, saying this shows how somehow we were right about Brexit. Uh, wherever somebody stands, whatever their worldview, everybody feels that somehow this is proof that they they were right all along and uh, th this is generally why I guess in times of crisis this is not a good time for a fundamental rethink of uh, of, the, of the entire economic system because this is uh, a time where when when we aren't thinking clearly yeah I mean Victoria then do you do you to end your remarks do you think actually coronavirus has brought an end to Thatcherism well, sadly, um, I, I fear that we have seen the end to Thatcherism quite some time ago. I suppose at least we haven't rolled back and renationalized industries, there's that. Yes. But the idea, um, in principle, that people are best placed to make their own decisions about looking after themselves and their families and interacting and looking after each other in their communities does very much seem to be on the back foot at present, even though, um, to go back, I guess, to where we started, it's exactly that that we are seeing at the moment. It's people, um, whether they're reaching out to their neighbours, popping notes through the door, delivering shopping, volunteering for the NHS. In fact, a, a, aside from Boris Johnson's slightly dismissive remarks, I think it's the people of this country who are actually showing that Thatcherism is alive and well in, in, a, in a grassroots sense. Well, that's a cheery note to end it on. Uh, thank you both very much for joining me today. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Bye.